I'm going to leave this wet at the bottom here because I'm, I'm, I'm going to connect the, sh- I'm going to need to connect the shadow in uh, while that's still wet. So. Now let's get to our guest, Dan Marshall. You're in there. What are you sharpening your pencil? I was, I was spritzing my palette. Actually, oh, spritzing your palate. <laughs> yeah. I love okay, my well, hair on, so it was quite warm in here. So everything was a little bit needs a little spritz. All right. Well, I'm going to let you take it away. Okay. All right. So I'm going to just switch my camera around here. You don't need to see me while I do this. And here we go. Oh well, look okay. at that shameless at that. self-promotion, man. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'll take what I can get. Right. Um, <laughs> So the uh, wait, 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 hold those arms out. Just hold, hold those arms out and hold them still. Look at that. So Dan, Dan is a world renowned tattoo artist. Did you do do those yourself or do other people do them for you? No, it's, it it takes a lot of concentration. So it's much, much better to have someone else do your work for you. Even if you're capable, it's, uh, it's always going to be better to let, let some, let, let a professional do it. And you can just sit there and deal with, with, with what's happening. (laughs) <laughs> the, yeah, the, the pain yes the pain it, it yeah it's not it does hurt folks just a little bit <clears throat> yeah yeah all right um, go for it Dan. oh okay so you know the uh one of the main things um you know i love going out to paint you know we we love getting outside and we love painting and the the what i find the reality is and um you know this is just my humble opinion although professional so you know anyway um but having a sort of idea of what your process is and what your techniques you want to use, brushes you like, uh, color mixtures you like, all of those things can really be reinforced when you're in the studio. And it's it's really the idea of, of having a better idea of what you're doing um, when you get out there to paint. So you're not completely overwhelmed. And the more I know how I'm going to work through this painting, um, it's the same. I paint here a lot, plain air. Um, so it's 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 a reinforcing of um, the technique that I use in the studio. It actually becomes the exact same technique I go when I'm outside painting. So having that that knowledge and that real real understanding of knowing how to get through a painting um, is only going to help you when you're when you're out in the field. Uh, and you know, I know we all have different timelines and limited time um and getting out to paint plain air is the most important thing i think for growth and seeing tones and colors and all those interesting colors in the shadows and things um but it's sort of that balance right so it's it's like a little bit of studio a little bit of plain air um and uh so i'm going to go through a demo of this and the way that i'm going to approach this is exactly um how i would do it in the field and this is a, 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 it's a, it's a little bit more of a complicated, I'm sorry, it, it, it's not a very complicated scene, um, especially when we get some snow in there and it's backlit, it becomes sort of a detailed silhouette. So I'm also learning to kind of choose my battles. And when I go out to paint in the field, I'll, I'll know what to look for a little bit better. I'll have a better understanding of what I know I can pull off. You know, I, I don't want to be defeated when I go out. I want to, I don't want to necessarily do a great painting every time I go out, but I also don't want to feel like, Oh my gosh, how am I going to get through this? Okay, Dan, um, so before you oh, before you yeah. roll. Okay, sure. people people always want to know about your paper, your brushes and your paints. Okay, so the paper that I use is almost exclusively Saunders Waterford um 140 pounds rough paper. Uh and I get these in the big big sheets, they're 22 by 30 sheets and I'll cut them down to whatever size I want. This particular size is I'm doing is a quarter sheet which is 11 by 15 ish, you know, it's about 11 by 15. Um, and uh, for the pigment that I use, it's all tubed watercolor. I don't use any of the the, the cakes. Um, even in my sketch kit, I, I, I squirt tubes into the little empty, um, uh, into the little empty uh, containers. I have, a uh, que- just- I have a question oh. for you there. I'm sorry, I don't sure. want to interrupt you, but I did. Uh, no, hey, you're so the boss. What's, <laughs> what's the difference? Because it that stuff, even the tube stuff, is going to end up drying in there. You're not using it fresh all the time. Is that right? Right. So, you know, I do keep a, a fairly fresh palette um, just because I paint often enough that I'm always filling things up. But the, um, you know, the cakes of watercolor are really compressed down. So I can, sure, I can reactivate them with a little bit of liquid, but I, I'm not going to be able to get much of a heavier consistency um so you get more it, tinting more tinting straight strength with tubed paints yes yeah because it is it will 
reactivate. Um, it, they don't get quite as hard as the uh, as the, the the little watercolor blocks. Um, so even if this has been sitting in here for a couple of days, a little bit of water and a little bit of brushwork on it, and I can get back to some heavier consistency of pigment. Because um, and, and what if you're somebody the, like me who doesn't do it often? Uh, if if I let that sit for a month or two, do I need to put new tube paint out? Not necessarily. So one thing I do, I, I always have a sponge in my palette and it's, it's not, it's not, you know, it's just a damp sponge. Um, but I keep this in here when I close my palette up. And if, if you're going to be away from it a while, you know, you can put it in like a Ziploc bag and that might help keep a little bit of that moisture in there. Um, you know, if you know, you're not going to be using them that, that often. Um, yeah. So it's, it, it is, it, I mean, there's nothing like having freshly poured out paint, but even when I, if I know I'm going to teach the next day or if I'm doing a workshop, I'll fill my palette up the night before. So it sets a little bit. So it's just not all running and, you know, you open your palette and everything's washed, you know, kind of run into each other. Um, so, you know, I usually, I usually set it out the night before and then, then it's the perfect kind of uh, consistency the next day. All right. Uh, and the brushes. Oh, and, and I, you know, the, the brands don't really matter. You know, like if you're using an artist grade, a professional grade watercolor, um, I do use a mix of Daniel Smith, Holbein and Windsor Newton. And, I have different colors that I use from different brands because I have just experimented and I like them. Some of the colors vary a little bit from brand to brand, some of the uh, textures and the way they work. So I've, I've really kind of gotten to a point where I like um, in a really short condensed version of that, like my traditional cadmium type things are mostly Windsor Newton. Um, my more opaque kind of like accent colors are usually Holbein, like lavender and lilac. Uh, I really like Daniel Smith's warm, pigments. So most of these are Daniel Smith over here. Um, I like their burnt sienna. It's a little pinker than the yellow than a, a Windsor Newton. So there's, you know, been some experimentation there to kind of really just get to the things I like. Um, and uh, I'll be using, basically I'll be using uh, just three brushes for this painting. Um, a nice big squirrel mop brush. And this particular one was given to me in China from a company called Martini. Um, but it's just a squirrel mop. So it's, it's a nice, it's got a nice point. So when I'm doing washes, one, it's going to flow very softly off of the brush, but I also have this nice point if I need to cut around shapes. Um, now I'll be using a little, a little, uh, this is just a little mop brush that I'll be using for uh, some of this dry brushing grassy stuff. And I'm also going to use this fan brush, which is, you know, th this is another thing that's fun in the studio. If I was out in plain air, I might not want to experiment with some wacky brush just to see what it does. But in the studio, I've, you know, I, I'll take those chances. So this is, uh, this is just some uh, natural bristle, cheap fan brush, but I'll be using this to kind of create some of these, uh, again, some of these dry brushy grass growing through the snow. And also in a Skoda Perla number seven, uh, this is a synthetic brush and this holds a lot of pigment this doesn't. So when it comes to putting in some heavier tones in the shadows and things uh, and doing the fence posts and smaller detail, I'll switch to this synthetic brush. Um, just just so, for the sake of discussion here, Dan, that's four brushes, sure. not three. Oh, all right. Three. All right. three. Okay. <laughs> if this didn't have this grassy stuff, I probably wouldn't use the fan brush. So yeah. this is really like a, a special effect brush. Um, but generally, as I work through a painting, I'm going to start with a mop brush and, and kind of get nice big washes. And then I'll basically work through pigment consistencies to where I'm using thicker pigment and I'll end up using a synthetic because it holds less water. All right. So how does this relate to getting ready for plein air painting? Uh, help me understand what, what your thought so, process is. So my thought process is um, really, you know, there, there's plenty of ways to skin a cat or a fish or whatever. Um, and knowing what works for you the best, what's going to, um, how you learn to work through a painting, right? So you develop a painting process. Um, and my process that I've really identified by doing studio work and figuring out what happens when I am outside painting and because of the medium I'm using, you know, watercolor is a little bit different. So, you know, we're not painting dark to light, you know, we're, we're painting light to dark. So I'm gonna think about my lightest tones first, which is gonna be my background and I'm gonna sort of work my way forward. And I'm basically gonna paint everything except for the middle ground shape. Um, and I'm going to put washes right through that though. I'm not going to negate that. So I'm going to basically do an underpainting and then put the, the sort of darker stuff on top and understanding that's how I like to do it. That's the process I do. I, I know I'm going to set my, the whole tone for my painting through this background tone. 
all the su successive tones are going to be based on how light or dark that sky is. So, you know, I've, I've identified my process. I've, you know, taken things I've learned from people. I've adjusted that. I've experimented and I've done all these kinds of things. And I know what's going to work. So that just that idea of do I know how I'm going to get through this painting and the forethought and that sort of thinking through, you know, watercolor is very much a chess like medium where you need to know all your moves before you kind of get in there. There's plenty of room to experiment and play, um, but it's all within a nice sort of construct. And well, you know, let's get doing... into it. Let's do right. this. Let's do it. So, you by know, the by, way, by... you got people watching from all over the world. I see oh, Netherlands, boy. I see Portugal, um, a lot of Canadians. Oh, hello, Canada. And then there's Cleveland. Oh, hey. I used to live in Akron for a while in my teenage years. Okay, so as I'm mixing this color for the sky, I'm going to be a little careful because, I, like I said, this I know that this is going to sort of set the tone for my whole painting. So I don't want it too dark. I don't want it too light. And I don't want it too blue. It's a, it's it's got a little bit of gray in in it, so I'm uh, being careful. I'm not rushing to try and find that color. And I am working on a forty five degree angle, um, so I'm always working sort of top to bottom. I'm letting gravity kind of help me pull this wash down, and I'm going to take this right down to kind of through that mountain. I know there's going to be a darker tone on there, so I'm going to go through that. You know, you have to then, use a different angle in different cities because gravity is different in every place. That's that's <laughs> true. <laughs> the um, you know, it's funny because the one of the main things is the humidity level is really going to affect um, how this is drying on your paper. So you know, again, by having that time, getting to know your paper in the studio, getting to know um, exactly how that process is going to work is um, uh, it, it's all reinforcing kind of what you probably know already or you think you know, um, but it, it, it becomes this, uh, it, again, it's, it's all about that kind of reinforcement of, of like what is actually happening here. And I don't want your eye to go too far into this background. So I'm, I'm basically just adding water to this mix down. And this is gonna be sort of the base for my snow. If I want snow highlights of actual white highlights, I can't leave white paper everywhere. Um, so I know this is going to come through and I'll get into just a little bit of dry brushing here to leave some, some little spots of some, some brighter snow. I'll bring this down. Um, but really I'm establishing the background and foreground now with, with these, with these sort of tones. Um, and, and I haven't really changed color yet. So I'm just using this as a base. Now, before this dries, I am going to come in with, uh, this guy, and I'm going to grab a little bit of burnt sienna and a little bit of yellow ochre, and maybe just a tiny bit of cobalt turquoise. And I'm just going to kind of tint some of this dirty, dirtier kind of snow area back there. Uh, and again, this is this is the underpainting, so this is not the the finish. It's just sort of uh, establishing some, uh, some stuff. And that's, I think one of the bigger struggles of watercolorists or, or painting in watercolor is, um, you know, a lot of people want to kind of work through their painting and have it be completely perfect as they go. But the reality is, is we need to sort of build, build layers. So essentially this will be three layers, a background, the a foreground wash, and then the middle ground wash. Okay. Now I am going to get a much sort of darker here in this foreground. So I'm gonna come in with some, basically just some cobalt blue and a little burnt sienna. And this can just be wet. I can come in here and spritz. And you know, there, there's a lot of my experimentation in what I'm doing. Uh, color experimentation happens a little bit more when I'm in the field because I'm actually seeing those colors and I'm understanding them. Um, and the, uh, uh, brushwork and effect work uh, that kind of gets a little bit more experimented with in the studio. Um, so I, you know, so I know if I make this fast movement, what's going to happen if I want to come in and then dump water in here, I'm going to switch brushes, grab a little bit of water 
and kind of just dance around while this is still wet and let this kind of do its own thing and make these sort of icy snowy effects. And again, I don't wanna to get too dark here. So I'm judging everything. So the background tone is gonna inform my foreground tone. And if I do this all too dark, then this midsection, which is backlit, is going to have to get really dark. So I've you know, learned to kind of look for that and, and know this was going to be fine once I get that dark in there. So it's, it's really a matter of um, envisioning what you're doing, thinking about that process, thinking about how am I going to get through this. Um, now I'm going to, this is actually like a weird grayish, it's just a cool, but it's just a weird kind of... Um, grayish green but but cool and i'm going to build this up a little bit just to give me a little bit of that lead in for the uh, uh how that atmospheric perspective is going to go okay so what i'm really demonstrating here is is my process right so i've learned how to work through a painting um you know i do paint a lot but i always am reassessing things i'm always learning how i can get through a painting quicker um and still tell the story and one of the, the big things about, you know, plein air painting is, um, you know, I don't necessarily want to be photographic. I want to uh, have some uh, poetry there. I want to have some, some nuances and things. Um, and by spending that time in the studio, I can learn to figure things out. So the way that I'm like putting stuff in here, letting it dry a little bit, then adding some more, it's all, you know, from learning that timing um, and that's all everything from the consistency of pigment to, to how dry or wet the paper is. Okay, so I might even splatter on that just a little bit. And I haven't really dealt with any of that grass yet. I'm also working my largest shapes to my smallest shapes. So this shape here is the first largest, then the second largest. Well, actually, it's a high horizon line, so switch that but these are my two largest shapes so i'm working larger shapes down to smaller shapes and all that grass and things um that's that, those are like small shapes so I, I can worry about that later that's for the next the next pass okay so i've been kind of stalling and chit-chatting a little bit to make sure this is dry um the other thing well, also is, i'll tell you, you this know, dan we have people yep. watching from uh from germany the person oh. in germany says uh you're their favorite watercolor painter Hey. Oh, geez. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. India, UK, uh, Australia, and Poland. Poland, thank you for all the assist you're giving. Uh, we all give you a thumbs up, Poland. All right. All right. Yeah, it's it's hard times. You know, we, we get through the pandemic, and then there's some other aggression and things. You know, when can we... I guess there is no normal anymore. It's it's just life. Life is happening in Odd ways. We'll, get, we'll get through it all together. We're here. We're a yeah. big family. Yeah. Well, I hope this is a, a, a nice distraction from the media um, onslaught. And, uh, you know, we know we pray for everybody that's that's going through all the hard stuff. And yep. um, if nothing else, hopefully this will be a nice distraction from uh, from all of that business. Um, distraction is why we're here. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. OK, so I've let all this dry. And now I'm going to move on to my next thing. And it's not this middle ground. I really want to paint. There's a figure in here. I want to paint him. I want to paint this uh, corral, but it's not time for that yet. So it's, you know, I've got to stick to my plan, stick to my guns and stick to what I know is going to help me get through this painting and, and hopefully have it be uh, uh, nice. Okay. I'm also, so now I'm using a little French ultramarine and a little burnt sienna. I'm going to throw just a little bit of purple. Oh, that's too much. Uh, if you over, if you mix wrong, just take it right out. Um, nobody's perfect. Okay, so there we go. We've got sort of a grayed out blue. Um, I don't want to do this too purple. It'll bring it too close. I don't want to do it too blue. It'll push it too far away. So I'm sort of looking for that middle, that sort of middle tone. And I've got a tone through here already. So uh, I can keep this fairly thin and really th sort of think about some of that atmospheric perspective. And I'll do a test there. And that's actually a little too purple. I'm going to add a little more blue in there, just a little bit of cobalt blue. And let's see what that does. OK, there we go. And I'm going to dry brush to leave a little bit of that sort of tree liney stuff there. Um, but I really don't want this to be to come forward too much. I'll bring it down. And now when I start to leave some dry brush skips, 
I've got this tone under there. So that's going to actually, uh, you know, it'll suggest uh, snow that's far back there in the shadow. Um, but really, it's, it's, I'm always trying to simplify. I'm trying to uh, just sort of give the message of, of what's back there and not, not worry so much about being completely accurate or perfect. I don't need to totally follow the shape of this. I've, I've shifted this whole kind of mountain over this way and shortened this gap. And it's all some sort of design stuff, but okay. I'm just gonna put a little water here to soften that edge just a little bit. And I'm working my way through. And, you know, th this gets really confusing down here. And, I, you know, I don't want to confuse the message of the painting. All this has to be is a sort of mountain that's back there in, in the background. Um, so I'll leave a highlight on this little hill here. And then some little directionals kind of happening back there. Jeff Eikoff says he loves how Dan has changed the design to make it stronger. Would you talk about that briefly? Yeah. So, you know, one of my big biggest... Um, <clears throat> oh, I don't know, pet peeves is uh, composition without any thought, right? So you, you have a photo, maybe it's a beautiful photo, and you say, I want to paint this photo, and, and you, you try to, you don't think about the design of the painting. You, you think you're, you're looking at the photo, and you're thinking about the photo without really thinking, well, is, that, is this even a good, is this composed well? Is this, is this, you know, is this composed well? And there are some interesting sort of directionals happening here. We've got this really nice kind of zigzaggy thing happening. Um, but what I've done, I always work on a rule of thirds as my starting point. And essentially, uh, and oftentimes I will put in sort of tick marks on the outside of my paper to, you know, when I'm doing the design process, um, uh, I tried to save time by, I have a sketch down in here, but um, I'm always thinking about where are things placed in this third. I don't want three equal strips. You know, I either want a high horizon line or a lower horizon line. I never want it in the middle. And where this third cuts through here, um, this is going to become my center of my focal point, my center of interest. So uh, I've redesigned everything to help kind of point you over in this area here. So when I come in with some of these grass, that's going to sort of lead up to here. Um, this will kind of come down and then this sort of leads you back in. This leads you in here. So there's there's a lot of V's happening. There's a lot of funneling. There's a lot of directional that happens in the composition so it's you know i've, I've cropped this over to here uh, i have moved this over this way a little bit so it's, it's all to, to make a stronger painting. you, you so, oftentimes do a sketch just a small sketch and a sketchbook uh to make sure you get it where you want it to be you, you know the it, it almost hurts me to say this but a lot of times i don't um oh, oh, <laughs> At where where I am because there's not a right or wrong down the uh, plein air police right. are not going to get you. I don't know. They might. They might. So one of the things I find is I all lose inspiration. Um, so I don't like doing tonal studies. I don't like doing full like if I'm out working in my sketchbook, I, I will. Um, but I, I, I uh, you know, I do often do no tan sketches, which I have talked about with you before. Um, and I've done, uh, you know, I'll do thumbnails and, and things like that. But, um, you know, for one of the main things I really like to do is, is try to work through that painting as mentally as possible. Um, so then it, when it's time to paint, I can just get in there and paint. So that also speaks to the preparedness is um, if you haven't read Edgar Payne's composition uh, for, or yeah, composition for outdoor painting, that's the, the, the best Bible manual uh, to learn stronger composition skills. Um, but, you know, I do, you know, I will on occasion do just no tan sketches. They're just black and white design sketches. Um, but I, I, I mean, this is a small port. I have a, I have thousands of these. So and, by and we the, out we outline the process that he goes through in his videos. You know, he's got uh, one called Effortless Watercolors, one on Cityscapes, another on Plein Air. So right, Dan, we'll, actually, there there we go. This is the actual no tan that I did for the video um, of that. So I, I do keep these and I and I go back and uh, um, you know refer to them. But it's it's you know as much as you gain brush mileage, you can gain design mileage, and you can start to know the space you're working in. Um, so at bare minimum, I will put these tick marks just so I know where my sort of rule of thirds is here. Um, it's the same thing when you go to crop a photo, those, those, that grid comes up to help you compose a better photo. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pick one of these intersections to be my focal point, and that's going to sort of dictate everything. So this is an interesting area to me. So I'm going to recompose to where, you know, it's basically more like, like this. So I know this is going to, you know, I'm going to, your eye is going to land somewhere around where these, these two lines intersect. Uh, and then everything else just supports that. It, it's all to support the, um, the idea of, of what is this painting about? And it's, you know, there's no cows out here. They're not grazing out here in the winter. Um, so maybe this guy's out here, you know, I'm trying to develop a little bit of a narrative with a figure to just say, well, maybe he's out here doing some stuff, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's that simple. Um, you know, it's, it's giving yourself some sort of reason for the painting, some sort of something beyond, oh, that's a nice photo, you know, uh, and, 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 and developing uh, a story, you know, and, and if it's not interesting, if there's nothing interesting about it, you know, it's not going to be an inter interesting painting. It's just going to be a collection of, of tones and shapes. Um, so one of the things I really like to sort of think about and push is the idea of, um, you know, am I telling a story here? What's my, what's my narrative? Just putting in some little, little, little bushes there. And this is being really careful. I just want these soft back here, just some little soft things. Uh, Cause again, I don't want to, I don't, this, this isn't the painting. This is the painting or, you know, the, the, I'm thinking about the whole painting. So I'm, I'm trying not to overdo anything anywhere. Okay. And with this stuff here, I can just kind of suggest in, uh, again, I've got that tone underneath. So if I just kind of dry brush on top of that, that's going to give me the effect of some of this stuff happening back here. through here like this and i'm still i'm again i'm working my way forward so each section you know the sky i'm working my way forward the foreground i'm starting and working my way forward the mountains are at the top and they're it's this sort of middle ground is working its way forward and uh i guess i guess i can come in down here and do some of this stuff and again this could change i could put this middle section in before i start to come in and put in some of this sort of idea that there's grass growing through here. Um, but, you know, that that's where the sort of, you know, when it gets down to this point, I, I, I do have the freedom to kind of think, well, do I want to put this stuff in here yet? Or do I want to wait? Um, so it, at this point, to me, knowing how I want to do things, what I'm going to do, it doesn't matter. So I can, I can have fun and, and kind of come in and do some of this stuff now. Um, and this is getting drier. So I'm going to come in here with this fun fan brush now. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking about this, there's a, a slight hill here. So I might want to just put in uh, the idea that this is some directionals that are kind of coming in there. Leave some grass through here. All right, as a question from the audience, it's to ask what device you're using to view your reference image. Oh, this is an iPad Pro. All right. It's just, uh, it's the larger, the larger yep. iPad Pro. Um, uh, but it, it's, it's a nice size to work. Honestly, though, when I'm working, if, when I'm working in the studio and working from photos, a lot of times I am just using this is sort of for your benefit. Um, <laughs> um, a lot of times I am just using the monitor on my screen, on my phone, um, because it, it helps me not get caught up in detail too much. It helps me see the, the shapes better. Um, so it, it's, you know, I, I don't, with this type of painting, you know, I'm, I am really looking for more of the personality of the scene. I'm looking for um, those sort of abstract shapes and things. And sometimes seeing it too big actually is detrimental to, to my interpretation of it. Okay, so this is just a start of this. I will come in and do some, a couple more things down here later, but we can get into this middle ground, which is where all the fun begins. And uh, when I get in here, this is going to make everything else somehow all of a sudden feel okay. Um, and that's the, you know, this is the, the the kind of painting where you're, you know, when you're painting outside and someone walks up and you're, they're like, oh, that's not very good. <laughs> you know? tuned in late. Um, There's a question. 
Question from Alexander Cummings, who says, what, what uh, are you using for the grass? That's a fan brush, a traditional fan brush, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's a, um, it, it is a uh, natural bristle, so it breaks up all weird. Um, you know, if you, if you try this with a, a synthetic bristle, um, again, it's just going it, it, to be even. too smooth. Yeah, it'll be too even. So this is just great because it's just a wacky. It's just a wacky random brush. And when I'm doing this now, I am getting a little bit thicker with the pigment. Um, and this doesn't hold a lot of water. So I know that, you know, when I come in to, to do stuff here, it's not going to be too runny. Um, you know, I, I save the runnier stuff for the initial washes. And then as I start to work through the painting, I'll get, you know, successively a little bit thicker as I build on top of those layers. So I don't get that kind of, um, you know, it really create, this is still all translucent. So we get a lot of color harmony here, but honestly, I haven't used much beyond burnt sienna, French ultramarine, a little cobalt blue, and a little bit of uh, cobalt turquoise. Um, so I'm not, you know, I'm staying within a sort of color gamut and then creating that kind of harmony in through here. Okay, so now comes the fun part. We're going to work on these, the corral and the, um, the barrel here. And these are basically detailed silhouettes, you know, so they're, they're, they're uh, backlit. I don't want them to be black and boring, so I will do some fun stuff with dripping some color in there. And I'm actually going to bring a little bit of lavender into this burnt sienna and a little bit of uh, French ultramarine. Uh, and let's see here. Start with this and do a test. And I'm going to kind of block in this whole shape first. That's what we call bravery. <laughs> right. The, uh, you know, the, you know, having that confidence and that sort of bravado is um, developed. You know, it's not, it's not, oh, he does that because he's that good. It's, it's been a long process of getting the cojones and uh, the confidence to, to know I can do those strokes. Did you just say cojones on? on cojones. Here? I did. Sorry. I, I didn't know if that was a, if that was in the. <laughs> in the uh fcc rules or not okay uh, and now facebook I, is not regulated by facebook oh, is not right. regulated by the fcc <laughs> right. right well i don't i don't, certainly don't mean to offend anyone um okay and while this is wet i'm just going to drop in some some of these cooler tones it just it's gonna it you know it, it's i've put down a warm base and then i'll sort of cool it off and that's just gonna give me a little bit of interesting stuff happening in there uh here's a little more blue And um, I'm going to leave this wet at the bottom here because I'm, I'm, I'm going to connect the sh I'm going to need to connect the shadow in uh, while that's still wet. So um, uh, I can see that there's plenty of liquid here because this shape is it's not just the corral. It's it's the shadow shape that connects into it also. Uh, so before I do that, I'm going to grab some really thick pigment and do some of these fence posts and some of the, the stuff on top of the corral here. A little gate at this end and this is just fun calligraphy stuff and i'll put uh the idea that there's some in there and there's this larger piece that comes through here and yeah i want it to look rustic i don't want it to look too perfect i want it to have some personality um but this dark now is pushing all of that background further way further back so um you know if i had done that background too dark i know that this wouldn't have pushed it as much as uh, as it is now so it's all kind of pre-thought out and, and pre-thinking let's put another little vertical there drop in just a little bit of dark here um and this is still wet here, so I've, I've learned that timing. Um, and again, you know, when I'm out painting outside, I will try to be very careful about uh, my position to the sun. So if I don't want the sun um, blasting on my painting, because uh, it's going to make it dry too fast. And, um, you know, so I'll usually put my, try to either paint in, you know, facing the sun or with my back, uh, you know, I can sort of work in a way that my body is blocking the sun if I'm painting something that's front lit. 
Um, but you know, it's all about learning that timing. And uh, Colorado is dry. There's no moisture here. <laughs> so I've had to adapt to that and, and, and work a little quicker and learn how to, how to get through paintings in, in, a, in a timely manner. Um, so that's also started to inform the way I work through things because it's, I just simply don't have the time to, to uh, uh, think about it, right? So, um, because it's going to be dry and then I'm not going to be able to connect shapes and things. So the, you know, again, that understanding of my process and the, the practice of my process to knowing that it's going to work when I get outside, uh, you know, it helps me work in the same way in the studio as I would as I would when I am out there in the field. So Karen was really asking cool. about your lavender and do you mix your lavender in? I think we saw you use lavender into some of the brown earlier. Yeah, so I, I had put some of that burnt sienna down and um, uh, and then I, I basically just dripped water. It's basically just a, a wet on wet mix of, um, you know, just sort of letting that mix and mingle and, and do its own thing. And you're going to get a completely different kind of tone and uh, interest uh, than if I tried to mix that in the palette. So having those colors mixed by themselves on the paper is is, is vital to create a kind of interesting uh, interesting tone that it isn't just the same color that you'll see. Like you know, every person who wants to paint this, um, you know, if you're using colors straight from the tube and you're not thinking about the the tones that you're mixing or, or how you're even mixing them, uh, then you're gonna you know you're gonna run into these very uh, you know, one of the, I'm really always interested in making watercolors that don't feel like they're just, um, oh, what's the word? You know, adult coloring books is one phrase I like to use a lot. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I want them to feel like paintings. I want them to look like paintings. And by always, I'm always mixing everything. So when people, you know, a lot of people will ask what color was that? And um, it's well, it's it's basically either a warm and a cool, or I'm mixing two neutrals together. Um, I'm neutralizing color with its opposing color from the color wheel. So you know, there's a little bit of, and that's a wonderful thing to learn in the studio is, is to experiment with color and and play with how those things are going to um, work. You know, knowing um, knowing what colors complement each other and what colors are going to neutralize each other. Uh, the you know playing around with that in the studio and, and just sort of uh, starting to really learn and understand that is, 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 is a great place to do it. Okay, so all that's really left here is to connect these shapes with the shadows. And this is gonna add some really fun uh, calligraphy, some really interesting uh, kind of uh, uh, just uh, unifying sort of stuff. The shadow of the, this guy connects into here. The shadow of this can kind of come over this way. So I'm, I'm considering about, you know, my this is backlit. So my light source is somewhere back over here. So I'm just bringing these shadows over this way a little bit. Uh, there's probably a little shadow from something back over there. Um, and as I'm kind of playing around with this, Eric, I got to tell you, listening to that promo, it's just amazing the relationships I've made through the different events that you do. And um uh, you know, thank you for for that. Always, it's it's amazing um, being able to say that most of the people in that promo are either friends or I've painted with or done events with. It's just uh, wonderful. So, um, you know, to anyone watching who's either considering going to the Planar Live or the Planar Convention, it is uh, it's just an amazing experience. So, I, I just wanted to again thank you for that opportunity to um, all of us to kind of get together and get to know each other. Uh, it's it's a wonderful thing. Thank you, Dan. That's nice. Yeah. Plein air convention is coming up in May. I've not mentioned that. Um, we don't know if they're going to allow us to have a full capacity. Right now, uh, we're about half full. And if they say cut it to half, we're going to be very close. So get your tickets and get it done, everybody. 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 Okay. So I'm just putting in some additional little fancy stuff back here. Fancy stuff. Fancy stuff. I Very light touch. Yeah, this is, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have much pigment on the brush. It's right on the tip here and I'm holding the brush way at the back. So I just get these nice uh, kind of delicate, delicate marks. And again, that, that comes from studio practice and, and, and learning, getting in those brush miles and knowing if I press a little harder, I'm going to get a thicker line. If I press really thin with the same brush, I can get a kind of thin line. So I'll just kind of put something there. 
I'll have something popping out over here. And then I just might do a couple blades of like what I would call hero grass. Um, uh, they're just, a, why do you call it hero grass? Hero grass. Cause it's, it's sort of like important grass. So I, I've kind <laughs> of, uh, you know, like if, if I do, if I had a crowd of figures here, there would be one figure that I consider the hero figure. And he's the one that has to look the most like a figure. And then everything else can just sort of be humanoid. Um, so I, I sort of apply that to grass. So this will be a grassy texture, but I might want like a nice, a nice, uh, uh, bigger sprig kind of through here. I'll add a couple little darks. So there, there are more things that help you identify these shapes as grass, I guess. And this, this can just go on ad nauseum. Uh, you know, it, 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 I don't want to get too much. I don't, and it's also hero because, you know, there, there isn't, um, there can't be a ton of heroes. There, there, you only need a, a couple heroes to really just say, you know what, this is some, some long kind of uh, Colorado grass cutting through some of this snow. Very nice. Okay. And that, that's basically it. Um, well, I why don't you come little... back on camera? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. What did you start to say? Oh, oh, I was going to say, you know, so one of the funny things is, you know, I've got this bl this little blob of pigment up here from a it's little, a, bird. a little, uh, it's a bird. Yeah, you got it. So I'm just going to, and this is sort of in the, in the foothills. So we're not going to have seagulls. We're not going to have a lot of things, but we will have a, a red tail hawk. So there's a little red tail hawk. A bird with a blob. Some kind of a little <laughs> bird with a blob. Okay. So let me switch my camera back here. All right. <laughs> and well that was a lot of fun Thank, thanks yeah, it was a lot of fun it's all you're and always fun to have me. on uh if you if you got in here late meet dan marshall everybody hi hey dan uh i i gotta give you a plug a shameless self-promotion you have created a watercolor plein air box that you design and sell and mm -hmm. i don't know if you're doing that anymore or not are you well, I'm really, I'm, uh, I'm really behind, um, and I apologize to everyone who's who's waiting. Um, I, I have six that are very close to being shipped out, so um, please be patient. I'm actually not taking orders at the minute until I can figure out a way to be a little bit more responsible with uh, my production because it is they're built completely by hand. Um, it's it's all you know. I'm I'm I'm, I'm there's no even the the slides and the the hinges and things are all handmade so uh it's it's a it's quite extensive process well, why don't you um, show it you have one handy why don't you show it to us i do let me see and, and then uh we'll put we'll tell everybody that can go on a waiting list and then, <laughs> right. and then of course you won't be painting you're going to be building so, boxes <laughs> so this is uh this is sort of the the full size version here um and it's it basically has a tripod mount um, yeah. so I can set up in seconds, this, this pops onto the tripod and then, and the top flips up and there's, there's storage for your brushes and all kinds of things. Um, but actually if I can, uh, expand on that for one second, I am doing a, um, oh shoot, I can't find it, but I started doing these smaller cigar sketch boxes, yeah. um, that are also completely designed for watercolor, but I think those are on the website. Um, but um, anyway, I I really well, enjoy the, the woodworking aspect, but I, I'm behind, so I apologize. Everybody. Yeah, I get that. Well, we'll yeah. put the uh, website up there, and people can uh, can check cool. it out and and maybe uh, get on the waiting list in, in case you notify. But it's it looks like a good product. I've seen it in person, and very well made, very handcrafted. So congrats there'll that. be a, there'll be a few at the plein air convention that people will be using. Um, so if you go, you can check them out there. And if you want to come visit my, my studio, I'll be happy to show you mine also. Yeah, terrific. Well, thank you, Dan. I appreciate you being on today. And thank you. Uh, thank you so much. We will see you at Air Live next week, starting Wednesday is Beginner's Day, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, long days, ending the day with painting together. Uh, you're going to be on there communicating with people and teaching and so on. So thank you for doing that. And yep. then we'll yep. see you at the Plein Air Convention in May. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, unless a nuke comes in and gets us. Right. Well, let's, let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> let's hope everyone just takes their toys and goes home. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dan. Have you ever wondered how some artists get such realistic quality in their work? 
You know, unbelievably beautiful portraits, stunning figures, and realistic-looking still lifes or florals? Painting or drawing realism takes your work to a whole new level. Whether you want tight, carefully rendered realistic paintings or looser, more impressionistic realism, most high-level artists will tell you that painting is a skill that anyone can learn. If you follow a process, you can paint beautiful, realistic artwork. But where do you learn? You could spend $3,000 or more to attend a live workshop or convention, or you can learn from the world's finest realists from home for a fraction of the cost. At Realism Live, the world's first virtual online realism conference, you'll get three days of world-class artists demonstrating their techniques and processes. This is a comprehensive conference covering all the subjects you want to learn in portraiture, figures, landscapes, still life, cityscapes, color mixing, and more. Taught by the world's leading artists. Not only will you learn their techniques, you'll have a chance to interact with instructors and get your questions answered. And you'll get to know other artists personally through our breakout sessions. And we'll even paint and draw together at the end of each day. Make new friends in our breakout sessions. Paint with hundreds of others. Get private access to our exclusive members group to become a part of our community. And learn to take your artwork to a higher level. Realism Live is three full days of painting and drawing instruction, November 10th through 12th. And for people who want to learn painting and drawing from scratch, start with our Beginner's Day One Day Atelier on November 9th. Soon you'll be painting faces, people, flowers, scenery, objects, and other subjects. You'll see your artwork improve faster as you learn from top artists and instructors from all over the world. Sign up today and join the world as we learn art together from these amazing artists. Glenn Vilpu, John Potoshenek, Alex Kelly, Ned Mueller, Terry Strickland, Dustin Van Welchel, Lisa Egley, Clyde Aspavig, Sarah Sedwick, Rose Franson, Chuck Morris, Michelle Dunaway, Michael Mittler, Daniel Graves, Leona Shanks, Alexander Shanks, Juliet Aristides, Carol Peebles, Tony Pro, Todd M. Casey, Cornelia Hernes, Sandra Angelo, Oliver Sin, Sharon Sprung, Mario Robinson, Deborah Hughes, and many more to be announced. And it's hosted by fine art connoisseur and publisher Eric Rhodes and editor-in-chief Peter Trippi. And if you can't watch live, you can watch replays on your own time for up to a year. And it's 100% guaranteed. You'll be pleasantly surprised to realize just how much you can learn in such a short time. Realism Live, from the publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine. Sign up today to reserve your seat now 